Welcome to our Sans at Mike. I know that some of you might have thought it's at Mick, but it's definitely at Mike. My name is Michael Hoffman. I'm a Sans instructor and I have written the Sans Sec 487 class and I teach it as well. And that 487 class is all about open source intelligence. And our pre my presentation tonight is going to take you through some of the high level things but also we'll go into a little bit of depth into, into some technical areas that are kind of fun to play around with with open source intelligence mostly one of the things i want to get uh, in, across to you is that if you're just using google to do things whether you're a pen tester doing reconnaissance for uh, uh upcoming gig or whether you're a cyber defender and you're looking up ips and domains we can go a lot farther because google Bing, DuckDuckGo, Yandex, these search engines do not have all of the information that we think they have. And with that, a couple other things. First off, this is being recorded and we'll be uh, going ahead and, and posting it online afterwards. Also, um, I know that many of you like to follow along and write down all of the links and stuff. At the end of this presentation, I have a short URL that will allow you to get a list of all of the URLs that I talk about here. And let's face it, it's uh, 8.30 in the evening for me. For some of you, you're probably just waking up. Uh, others, maybe lunchtime. Uh, the last thing you kind of want right now is a PowerPoint presentation that lasts an hour. So what I've got is about 15 slides. And then from there, I'm doing all live hands-on demos. <laughs> And yeah, there's a little bit of risk with that. I can I can see some of you just kind of shaking your heads probably like, all right, you know, what's he going to do on the internet? Well, I'm going to try to keep it somewhat tame to make sure that we stay safe here. But also, I, I want to show you the real world. You know, if, if I show you this canned um, virtual machine that's all safe and everything works, that's not the world of open source intelligence. We have to get in there dig into pay web pages, get into some of the nitty gritty in order to better serve our customers and answer their questions. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and just remind you that we will be taking questions. If you have them, please place it into the, the question chat box and I will get to them at the end of the talk. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, I remember how the internet used to be. You know, we used to log in. Well, what we used to do is take that phone line, that phone line off of our our the wall phone in the kitchen, and we'd plug it into our Hayes modem, and and you'd dial into the internet in some form or fashion, and then you'd do whatever you needed to do, and you'd get off. Right? You would log in, and you'd log out of the internet. But nowadays with our smartphones, with these devices that are on 24-7, 365, pushing data about us, what we like, what, we, uh, what we're doing, who we're doing it with, where we're doing it, they present a huge amount of, they push a whole bunch of data up to the internet. Unfortunately, some of that information can be scraped harvested and used against us or used to further an OSINT investigation. It just depends on whether you're the target or the subject or whether you're the investigator. Now on this slide, we have the web page as it used to look. This is the very first web page from CERN. It's now archived at CERN in uh, Switzerland. And on the right-hand side, we have Google Maps interface, which not only shows us the maps uh, that are, are pretty well up to date, but it'll show us pictures, it'll show us traffic overlays, it'll show us where to get coffee or where the closest bar is, depending upon where you are and what time of the day it is. These things are amazing and with complexity comes opportunity. You see, nowadays people share too much data. I'm going to just throw that out there. And I'm hoping that you're somebody that's like, yeah, yeah, I know somebody that that is just like that. You know, that you've seen these people, the people that order food in a restaurant and they they get the food and they're like, oh, that looks really good. And instead of picking up the fork, they pick up their phone and they, they take a picture like, oh, this is going to be good. And they take that first picture and they send it up to their whatever the website is that they like using. Then they have one bite. Oh, I took a perfect bite out, so I take another picture of it, and so on and so on. 
These people aren't necessarily, no, aren't only sharing what they're eating, but they're also sharing things like where they are, who they're with, and what's around them. Sometimes within open source intelligence, what we do is we look for those bits behind the subjects, the bits around the subjects. Um, my colleague, uh, Ben Strick, who works for, um, who works for uh, BBC, he just released a really great blog post showing how he identified where John McAfee, you know, that John McAfee actually is or was based upon a photo that he had tweeted out. And that photo had different pieces and pulling out each of the pieces, doing some research on it, allowed Ben to find where John was. Now, even if you are a person that is security focused, you're conscious of what you send to the internet. Maybe, you know, I'm looking at some of the names here that are in this webcast and I bet many of you don't even have uh, social media. I can see we've got like 10 John Doe's well done, people. Well done. Uh, but, I mean, you're security focused, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be on this webcast. And I'll bet some of you don't even have Facebooks or LinkedIns or anything like that. So, so you think, hey, I'm more secure. And to some degree, you are. But in today's world, much of what happens, happens behind the scenes, uh, with, either with data brokers or with our friends that are sharing pictures of us or with random people that are taking pictures as we walk through the streets or once quarantine's over we'll walk through the streets again and you know your picture will be captured in behind somebody or your face will be captured behind somebody's selfie and then that gets shared up to a social media platform or in this case the u.s government or your government around the world, depending upon where you live, may be sharing data about you and the people that you love. This is a website by the Federal Election Commission, the FEC. And what it does is it shows people who donated how much money to which candidate in an election in politics and how much that donation was. But there's other information here too. For instance, if you donated along with your company, then that official record of Micah Hoffman and his company, Spotlight InfoSec, are tagged to a certain candidate in a certain election. And once the election's finished, do you think that data goes away? No, of course not. And that information is out there and people around the world can harvest it. Now in my SEC 47 class, one of the things we talk about is those forbidden subjects. I, you know, when I, when I first started teaching, I remember, um, I'm not sure if it, I'm not sure which one of my mentors told me, but they said there, there's three things you should never, ever talk about uh, in class or in public. One is politics, one is sex, and one is religion. Well, in class, many times conversations move to those areas, not for a, a discussion about theology, but because some of these groups that people belong to, whether it's political groups or whether it's religious groups or community groups, share information. I'll bet many of you out there belong to some kind of group, whether it's a, a church, a mosque, a temple, or maybe it's a Boy Scout or Girl Scout, or maybe it's a, a baseball or a, a cricket league or something like that. And I'll bet some of those actually publish on their web pages a PDF newsletter of hey, this is what's happening this week, or Johnny hit a home run at the last week's tournament, uh, last week's baseball tournament, or our congregation is really excited at the birth of so-and-so, parents, uh, and, congrat and congratulations to the parents, so-and-so, and so-and-so. This information about people, about life events, and about, well, as you can see on the slide, pictures of kids with names, all of it can be harvested in seconds. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to, to show you the reality of, of the world that we live in right now. Many people are like, this is great. I can get my PDF newsletter of, of my organization online. I don't have to you know, log into some Yahoo or Google group to get it. Well, if you can get it, other people can too. And sometimes we can harvest this information en masse in just seconds. We also know that in the world that we live in now, 
people are constantly trying to influence our thoughts, our opinions, our beliefs, and they'll do that through lies. Well, okay, many people are calling it fake news now, but the reality is, is it's lies. And there are many social media platforms, like Facebook here, who's making progress in showing us who is putting ads out about what topic. And for this, um, for this specific website here on Facebook, the ads library, you can go ahead and visit as long as you have actually even without an authentic without a regular Facebook account, you can visit this Facebook site, type in the topic of interest, whether it's Brexit or gun control or, or a political candidate, and see what organizations paid Facebook X amount of dollars within a range to deliver a certain message, and they'll show you the message, to a certain population of people in a certain location. It's ad transparency, and I, it's, it's moving in the right direction to allow us to understand who's trying to influence what we think and how we interact with the world. And that's the real problem with the world nowadays. I remember as a kid when I would I would go on to GeoCities or I'd go on to some other website and and when you saw a picture of a person, you knew that somewhere in the world there was a person whose picture that was. You know, there was a person behind it. But our computers have gotten to a point where it's so easy to create 100% false identities and images, that it's scary. For instance, on the left here, we see a picture of a boy. Um, and this is, many of you probably already know, from a website called thispersondoesnotexist.com. Now, thispersondoesnotexist.com is one of several websites that uses what's called a generative adversarial network or a G-A-N, to generate um, essentially machine learning type of images of human faces. And what they do is they have a set of computers that knows what a human face looks like with nose and ears in certain places and all. And they generate a huge number of, of samples. And then there's another group of computers that judges those samples, goes, that's not what a human looks like. That's not, oh, that one's a good one. And they will promote it. And that's what we see here. And when you go to thispersondoesnotexist.com and refresh the image, you'll get another picture and another picture and another picture of people that look real but have probably never existed. Well, actually have never existed. A buddy of mine and a colleague uh, on the OSINT Curious Project of mine, uh, Nick's Intel, just wrote a really, really good article or blog post uh, on how to figure out if a person's profile picture is from the this person does not exist site. Because you think about it, if you ran across somebody and in their Facebook feed they were putting out pictures like the one on the left here, you might not think anything of it until you realize that that's a 100% fake picture. Now the suspicion meter that we have might start you know, kicking off a little bit and you might wonder why they're posting fake pictures of people. And while we're talking about fake things, let's talk about deep fakes. Yeah, some of you have probably uh, seen the video on the right here of Barack Obama saying things that Barack Obama never, ever said. The reality is, is that they're using some special software. Jordan Peele from Key and Peele you did a Barack Obama impersonation and special software synced Barack Obama's lips to what Jordan Peele was saying. So when you look at this video, you're like, wow, that, that was amazing. That, that was Obama speaking. But in reality, Obama never said any of the things in that video. So we can't even trust, you know, kind of our own eyes and our own ears. And this, this is disconcerting because the reality nowadays is that it's easy to gather data. When I was a kid, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, if somebody wanted to find out what, what I was eating, who I was eating it with, where I was buying that stuff, they had to dumpster dive. They had to go through my trash and find the receipts or the packaging or whatever it is. Nowadays, nowadays we push it up to unknown servers in the cloud owned by people we've never, we don't know, we've never met with motives that are many times not clear. 
And the people that harvest this information, who knows what their motives are? <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Micah Hoffman. As I mentioned before, I am the author and the lead instructor of the SANSEC 487 class. I also am an OSINT consultant. I run my own business. I have a wonderful nonprofit, OSINT Curious. That's OSINTCurio.us. And um, that OSINT Curious website is one that I'll talk about a little bit. It has a huge amount of really cool blog posts by some extremely smart people, much smarter than me, and videos and other things. I've been in cybersecurity for a while, and I've actually got an undergraduate degree that's non-typical or atypical of uh, many people in cyber nowadays. I got a degree in psychology. And I love how psychology meshes with some of the things that we're going to talk about today. If you want, you can find me on social media as web breacher and that's it <laughs> no don't go away don't go away um as i mentioned i have just a few slides here and i wanted to get into oh, let's do this i wanted to get into um some of the links that we're going to be going through so if you want to follow along at home go to this short url sec sec487.info that's a short URL, a URL shortener that I'm using for my class. And go to sans at Mike, or San, it also looks like Sansa T Mick, but let, let's go ahead and call it sans at Mike, all right? And there's a blog post there on my webreacher.com blog that has a bunch of the, the URLs with a little description about what I'm gonna show you right now. Cool. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna shut off the video and we're just going to go and use my computer over here and let's talk about some of these cool places out there in the internet on in the world first off this is the blog post that i was just talking to you about and this is the sans app mike moving past googling it and here we have the links to the different things that i'll talk about so i'm going to get rid of that next I always like starting out my presentations with where can you go if you're thinking a lot faster than I'm talking. Uh, I know everybody learns at a different rate. So I wanted to give you this website, osyncurio.us or osyncurious.com, whatever you want. This is a website that myself and some other uh, really smart people within OSINT have put together. And in here we have blog posts, we have other things um, that might be of interest to you, including all of these 10 minute tips here. These are 10 minute long OSINT videos that you can use to gain more information about, well, open source intelligence. In fact, some of the things that I'm talking about today are in this blog, are in, are in those 10 minute tips. The next thing that I wanna show you is a website that is uh, made by a friend of mine, Lizette Abercrombie. She's over in the Netherlands and she she's in the Dutch government and she made a website here. It is technozette.com. You see technozette here. If you go to technozette.com, it'll redirect you to the Start Me page. Now Start Me pages are really just bookmarking websites. They're a place for Lizette and other people to post their bookmarks. For instance, if you're looking for, well, let's go to search engines. Lizette has gone ahead and categorized different links to other websites. This is not like a blog post. These are actually you are, uh, links to uh, other websites. You see as I mouse over it, um, the, the links uh, will send her and send your browser to other sites. So what she has done is taken her knowledge of how to do open source intelligence and some other people's knowledge too, and organized these links for us. This is really helpful, especially if you're just getting started in open source intelligence. You can hop over here to this site or hop over to another website. This is osintframework.de. Osintframework.de. This redirects you to the Start Me page for Bruno Mortier, who's also over in Europe. And Bruno has categorized different websites in different fashions. And, and in fact, one of the things that he does really well is on this main page, he lists all these other OSINT frameworks and resources. 
And so if you don't know where to go, you can come here and his site will tell you not only um, different places to go to learn about personal infrastructure or image intelligence, but also what other frameworks are out there um, that you might want to use. Now the title of this talk is about moving beyond Googling it. And you know, for, for most of our daily lives, we and we deal with Google and search engines. And many of you have probably moved beyond Google to, to DuckDuckGo or some other privacy-focused search engines, and good on you. But one of the things that, that some of us know is that there are things that website administrators can do to prevent Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo, Yandex, whatever, uh, from indexing certain content on the web pages. And that is what it's called a robots.txt file. You can see here I've gone to cnn.com slash robots.txt. The robots.txt is a text file that sits at the top level of the domain and is present on most all of the websites that you probably have been visiting, but it's not meant for you to look at it. Those of you that are web pen testers or even regular traditional pen testers out there, you know that this file is really valuable because in this file, we have the places where website administrators have told search engines not to index. The question becomes, well, why? Why, do, why doesn't CNN want uh, Google, Bing, and DuckDuckGo? You see this user agent star that says all search engines don't, or be, they're disallowed from indexing the ads directory. Well, that makes sense, right? You don't want them indexing ads off of CNN, but did you know that CNN has an AOL directory? Yeah, I'm kind of wondering, is that back from America Online days? I don't know, but that's something that we would need to check into. Or what about this one? Some of you have probably looked at this and went, wait, there's a beta directory? Is that like new features coming up? Or is that the news from tomorrow? You know, like I picture they have reporters going out and going, all right, this is news that's going to happen tomorrow. We'll put it in beta. And then once it happens, it'll be promoted to uh, prod. But no, we can get a list of directories here that we could possibly just search to with our web browsers and find additional information that you will not find in the search engines. Now, some of these entries in here might be left over from, well, in AOL's time, in AOL's uh, case, it might be, you know, decades ago, but we could visit any of these. We could just take slash partners. Let's just see if this works. I'm going to just replace that, paste in, let's see, paste in.com. There we go, partners, and uh-oh, it could, and there you go, it's a, it's a, bad web page that page isn't there but what we could do is visit each one of those pages and try to find some interesting content that wouldn't be in a search engine all right so what you're probably thinking you know how is this even useful i could browse web pages but these robots.txt files they tell a story sometimes for instance let's go to a different website this one is for a popular website you might know of they sell produce uh, well, okay, Apple. Apple.com. They sell computers and phones, of course. And the interesting thing about if we read their robots.txt file is they exclude certain search engines from certain sites, uh, certain parts of the website, but they allow other search engines to go there. For instance, here they've specified the user agent for all spiders. They cannot go into any of these different directories. All right, cool. But now we get to a user agent for Baidu Spider. Yeah, Baidu. Do you all know what Baidu is? Yeah, it's a search engine over in Asia. I'm I'm responding like you're actually saying this. I'm used to giving this in, in a live version. Sorry, I know that some of you are probably shouting out right now. It's an Asian, Asian website. Um, yeah, this is a search engine over in Asia. And we can see that Apple doesn't want them to go to these sites here or these parts of their site here, which are different from the ones up above. So if you're using Google to find something about Apple, 
Well, you now have access to more content possibly than if you used Baidu because Baidu has these additional restrictions that they can't go into any of these directories and index content. If you use another spider here, there, there's even more restrictions. Isn't that interesting? So the website administrators at Apple are saying, well, you all over there cannot actually gather this information, but if you use these search engines, you can. And that's why within open source intelligence, one of the things we do is we use multiple sources of information. We use Google and DuckDuckGo. We'll use Bing and Yandex, but we won't just trust one search engine to deliver all of the results. Now, just to take this to the penultimate uh, conclusion here, well, I'm pretty sure I didn't use that word right, but you get the idea. Let's go to Cisco.com. Now, Cisco.com has a very professional type of robots.txt file. You know, this has probably gone through version control and is tightly controlled. And, and somebody at Cisco has probably said, you know what? We need to not only put a directory in there like um, the Cisco Googlebot Enterprise cannot go into the slash jobs directory, but in order for us to put stuff in here, we actually have to, you have to tell us why we can't do that. And so people submit things, I'm imagining, it's like, oh, this is a temporary entry per the performance team. So wait a second here. So you are putting a public text file on your website that says, do not go in this directory because if you do go in that directory, if you do index that directory, we could have a performance issue. That sounds like a recipe for a denial of service, right? If if a bad person were to stumble upon this file and pull out that, that comment, that's not gonna be good. Well, as we scroll down, it gets even, uh, more verbose. I'm going to go all the way to the bottom here. We at the bottom, it says, Hey, if you're coming from Yandex, which is a, uh, uh, a web application, spider, search engine, a whole bunch of things like Google over in Russia, you're not allowed to go into the global RU directory, which is interesting to me because you would think that a Russian website should be able to index. Russian or are you web pages, right? But Cisco has said, no, you can't do that. And not only that, at the bottom, I love that how they how professional they are here. Um, hey, you know, all changes to the robots that text need to be approved by this person, Melissa Jensen, Mel Jens. I'm guessing the last part of her email might be at Cisco.com. Yeah, if you're gonna be doing social engineering or whatever, and you're authorized having inside information about who at the company is responsible for this, really, really important. So I hope I've convinced you to go beyond Googling and not just use Google, but use other search engines. But I would be remiss if we just stopped there. There's so much more fun stuff on the internet. This is social media. Yeah, social media, you know, those places where we're uploading things, where we're sharing pictures and all. And some of you probably have identified this application. Well, it says it in the URL. Um, this is Snapchat. Now, Snapchat, when you use the social media app, normally how we use it is one person sends in a picture or a short video to another person. Once that other person watches it or looks at it, Within a couple seconds or 10 seconds or so, it gets deleted. But if you wanted to in Snapchat, you can you can essentially save stuff to your story. You can publish that uh, so that anybody can view that content. And it's geotagged within a certain area. So what we've got here is the Snapchat map. Without even looking, without even understanding how this works, I'll bet you could see some areas of activity on this map. Uh, for those of you that, that cannot see it, maybe you don't have a good screen or whatever, right over here in Marrakesh and right over here south of Gibraltar, there are some red areas. In Snap Map, this is kind of like a heat map. So the more dense information, the, uh, the more, more posts, the dent in the uh, brighter an area. Now I'm gonna take a risk here. I have no idea what's in these different places. 
I have no idea what people have published, but as an unauthenticated user, I can pull up content. So let's see, let's click on Casablanca and see what comes up. Now this has um, video and it has audio as well. I think I'm muting the audio. Um, let's see, that's pretty boring, pretty boring. Oh, we get somebody's snap. This is a, a scannable thing. All right, well, there's somebody. Somebody's going to bled, I guess, to bed. All right, here we have some other stuff. Oh, some food. All right, good. It was nice and safe. Now, you're probably thinking, well, what the heck? Why would I care about that? Well, sometimes what we need to do is monitor events like quarantines, monitor riots, protests and other things that are happening in the world and places like snapchat can sometimes allow us to gain access to information that we wouldn't normally have had and it allows us to get access to information from inside places that we wouldn't normally have, have been able to to see into for instance what if i zoomed in here to a place that was a military base or your office and somebody that was just very enthusiastic about their job had come in and done a snap video of the inside of your office and said, oh, I'm so excited to, to be here on my first day of wor at work at your organization. Check out all these people in line for badges. Check out my badge and shows a picture of his badge or her badge. Would that be a problem? Yeah, absolutely. And so what we can do is we can use these free uh, open platforms like Snapchat to look at what's happening in a certain area and to do some remote reconnaissance. Now, that's actually some, some really fun stuff. And there, there used to be a huge number of other types of remote reconnaissance tools that were out there, and there still are, uh, but a lot of the platforms are moving away from that. Uh, we can get geolocation information about people that are posting things on Twitter and other places like Facebook and all. But one of my favorite ones, and some of you know this already, is Untapped. Yeah, let me just show you some of the fun things we can do. Now, Untapped is a is a for those of you that don't know, it's a application that you put on your mobile device and its goal is to help you tag beers that you consume. If you drink a beer, you can take a picture of the bottle and say, oh, this tasted like oats and honey, and it was I'd rate it five stars. It was a great IPA or whatever. And then you post it on the website for other people to see. And it's social. So you can say, I was with this person. Well, let me just show you. So I'm just going to scroll to the bottom of the page. I'm going to pick a random place. All right. Uh, these are breweries. These are the popular ones. Let's pick one in Scotland. Brewdog. So this is typical. We've got activity here. Justin S. is drinking a Pulp Patriot by Brewdog. Matt E. is drinking this by Brewdog. Now, Brewdog is the actual brewery. But in other places, we can look at what location this person drank it at. For instance, if we look here. Here, Justin S. is drinking uh, that, uh, drinking that beer. Here, he's drinking that. And we can check and see other information about who he's drinking with and other stuff. So, why does this matter? Well, you've probably heard of death by a thousand cuts, and that's what I liken this to. Because I saw, um, well, I'll call him out, Phil Hagen. Uh, Sans instructor extraordinaire, he kept tweeting out, hey, I earned the badge for the most porters drank in Singapore, and oh, I earned the IPA king badge. And I said to him, Phil, why, why are you posting this stuff publicly? Why are you posting your drinking behavior? And he said, well, what's the worst that you can do? I mean, you know, what's, what's bad about it? And I thought, challenge accepted. He wants me to show him the badness here, the fun, you know, why he should care. Many of you that are in cyber, you probably get that question all the time, right? The, 
why should I care about patching that system? It's inside of our uh, corporate environment. Why should I care about not posting this? Well, what I decided to do is make a tool to help show people why they should not share their drinking activity on Untapped. And what this tool does is we feed it somebody's profile name. Like, let's go to this guy, Mogpert. Oh. Um, hang on one second. Yeah, let's do max. There we go. Let's go ahead and do max 2811. Oh, I think it's user. Hang on. There we go. Max. So, what we do is we find a person, or if you have an untapped account, we could do this with your information. And we take the information here, like max2811, and then we download my tool. Now, my tool is on GitHub, and it's called Untapped Scraper. Untapped Scraper is a tool that allows us to harvest information from untapped. It's a Python tool. And all we have to do is specify a user like max2811, and it will go out to the website and harvest information that Max has shared with people. Let's take a look at this. It just takes a moment. And we are done. Oh, aired out. I mentioned that I'm a psychology major, not a computer scientist, right? Okay. So let's take a look at the information that the script that the script harvested. We've got uh, the URL to his user profile, how many beers Max has said he drank. Well, let's take a look at that real quick. See this 101 total, 100 unique. Do we actually know that Max drank any of these beers? No, we see him holding cans, holding bottles, but we don't know any of these drinks were consumed. And that's a very important point. Um, these social media sites, we always look at it and we, we have to take all the information with what, what's called a grain of salt. We, we, we don't trust all the information. We have to investigate further. We can, we can hope that, or we can, uh, expect that some of this information might be accurate, but some of it might not be. So here we've got the, the general information. If you go to this URL right here, his friends, you see the friends that he's got or he that he said he drinks with. And then because each of the beers that he logged to the website, not necessarily drank, but when he logged it, it was tagged with the day of the week, the day of the month, the hour of the day, this script pulls all that out. So we see that of the last 25 beers that Max drank or logged, um, most of them were consumed on Sunday. And then here, the hours of the day, you can see that they were spread out, the last 25 beers. The la it's the last 25 beers because I'm not using an API key in order to extract this data. I'm visiting the website just like a Firefox or Google Chrome browser would and just extracting things from the page source. So by doing that, we only get the last 25 beers. We can see the time of the day that uh, he logged the beers. And we can also see the days of the month. So this is um, March 14th, March 16th, that's today. And because he has logged more than five beer, or five or more beers on those two days, the script pulls out that according to the National Institutes of Alcohol and Drug Abuse in the United States, he may be a binge drinker if these times here when he logged the drinks were within a two hour period. And we can see that they're absolutely not. We've got 1 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, definitely spaced out the drinks. But the other cool thing that we can do is we can look at the check-ins where this person has said that they actually drank or consumed those beers. And here we see the Vienna International Airport. We see some other places here. Oh, we got Costa Rica. 
Wuppertal, we see places all around the world. And if you have a Google API key for their geocode API or, or application programming in, interface type of uh, access, it will take the address that they've identified, like Vienna International Airport, and it will give us a latitude and longitude. And because of that, let me just go ahead. Um, so if some of you have watched cooking shows where they they take some some batter and they make it into you know cupcakes or whatever, and they put it in the oven and then they pull out some bat and some cupcakes that they made earlier. Well, I made some cupcakes earlier. Let's take a look at what Max's online profile looks like by going and looking here. Now you might not know anything about Max, but you can look at this map and see the different places where he's logged beers. We've got every places from locations in Costa Rica to places over in, let's see, Germany. We did see Wuppertal, and we see over here near Cologne. We've also got Brussels and Lille. Yeah, and these are heat maps too. Now, this is not that exciting because um, these be these he he doesn't have that many beers. But let's take a look at my buddy um, Mogford. He's not really my buddy. Well, I think he's my buddy because I do this demonstration a lot with his data. So, Mogford, if you're listening, you know, hey, hit me up, Web Breacher. Here we can see that he's got 113 check-ins at one place, 98, and this is not even the most by far. We've got a huge number of people out there that are, are logging 15,000 beers and stuff. So let's take a look at his information. And yes, I already looked him up. Da -da. Here's his information. All right. Oh, you can see that his his information, he's up here in this area and right there. All right. So let's zoom in. Now, if you were to see, if, you, if I was to ask you, where do you think this person lives or works? You could probably guess it right? Uh, there's a very big hot spot right over here in Cancun, and there's a very big hot spot over here in, looks like Boise, Idaho. Um, Boise, Idaho. Now, because this is Google Maps based, we can drill down into like this. Now, these are the hottest spots where he drank 40 or logged 43 beers, 22 beers, 27 and 17. So perhaps our target does some things around that area. You know, that would be something that we could look at. And we can track people. That's the thing I don't get. People allow us to track them. And here we're tracking them with their, their data, that other drinking behavior. You don't believe me? Watch this. Um, we can take this information about where Mogford or or Max 2811 has uh, gone, and, and we can plot where they've been. See, because we can take this. Let's do this. Let's bring up Max 2811, and let's just grab the last beers that he has logged. All right, so we've got Vienna International Airport on the 23rd. We've got Franz Kremer Stadion. we got Kicker Sports Bar. We can see different hotels where they say that they've been. Now picture this, you are trying to figure out where this person is. I don't know who Max2811 actually is, but let's say that you somehow figured out that your, your person of interest is named Max2811 and you stumble across the untapped account. And then you look on here and you see on March 12th that he logged a beer, drank at the, this hotel, and then you went out there to visit him because the next day at midnight, he logged a second one. And we could just take these and put them right into Google Maps and find out where this person is. Now, one of the things that somebody in my class asked when I was showing this to them one time in the 47 class was, okay, it's interesting that you're following a person, but could you follow a bar and tell me everybody that um, kind of drank at that bar? 
on a certain day or across time, I started thinking, yeah, that would be cool, right? Because many of you probably work at places and then you clock out of work or before the quarantine, you clocked out of work and you would walk across the street to whatever bar, pub or restaurant there and you'd drink a couple of beers. Well, what if you work at a classified facility? Or what if you work at a sensitive facility? Or heck, you know, just what if there was an accident outside of a bar and maybe somebody wanted to know who the frequent, who the patrons that frequented that establishment were? Well, I wrote a tool that does that thing, that very thing. It watches bars. And what I decided to do was watch, well, watch places where people drink, like airports. Yeah, people drink in airports. And in fact, what we can do is we can track people as they drink in the airports and move across the world. That's what we see here. These are untapped users that have drank, have logged beers in different airports, whether it's Atlanta, uh, Hartsfield Jackson, or Des Moines. Uh, we even have some other ones here like uh, Trudeau Internet. Yes, these are messed up uh, uh, UTFA characters. Sorry, but we can see that this is in Quebec. And we have the dates. So here on March 2nd, they logged a beer in Quebec. Then they went to Texas on the 3rd. And then they uh, and then they went back to Quebec on March 13th. There we go. We have a 10-day trip there. Now, is that accurate? Maybe. It actually might be. And we can even go and find out like what we just saw with Max 2811, what hotels they're staying at. I think you get this. I think you get the idea here that, that sharing even little bits of information with people publicly is probably not a great idea because there are people like me that have too much time on a Friday night and we will make these fun, fun tools to find stuff. All right, let's go back over here and let's talk about a different application. All right, let's talk instead of about people, let's talk about domains because some of you don't track people. Some of you are, are looking up information about domains and this is one of my favorite, favorite things to do. This is viewdns.info. This is a website that does a, a really neat thing for us. It does a reverse who is query. For those of you that have no idea what who is is and why we'd want to do a reverse query, let me just let you know that when you register a domain name like sec487.info or, or webreacher.com, I have to give a registrar certain information about me. I have to give them my name, my address, my email, my phone number, in case my domain starts hosting malicious content or does doing bad things, they need to know how to get in touch with me. Well, before GDPR hit the privacy regulations over in Europe, uh, we were able to query that who is database and say, who owns this domain? Who owns that domain? And it would give us name, address, phone numbers. It was great. And then GDPR hit and we lost access to some of that information. But one of the interesting things that I find is when you have to register a domain, you have to give it an email address. You have to give the registrar an email address so that you know they can contact you. But what we can do with who is searches like this, the reverse who is searches, is we can do a whole bunch of different types of queries, like the ones that you see in my dropdown. Let's go ahead and do one for at apple.com. What I've just done is I've asked view DNS to info to retrieve any of the domains that have an at apple.com email address as a registered point of contact point of contact now what we probably what we see here i'm going to just make this a little bit sl smaller and what we see is domain names domain names are not protected by gdpr what it cannot show us or should not show us is names, addresses, phone numbers, emails. So we don't know who at 0086sources.com, we don't know what their email address is, but we can find that out. But one of the other cool things that we do as a as OSINT investigator is we harvest information on mass. 
We talked about this, or I talked about this earlier in the talk. And you can see here that there are actually 12,000 domains that match this query. We're only seeing the first 500 of them. But even those first 500 can show us a story. Let me introduce you to a really cool free uh, web scraping tool. It's called Instant Data Scraper, and it's a Google Chrome plugin. See this little Pokeball-like thing up here? Instant Data Scraper. When I click on this, it will look at the web page here for any HTML tables. This content down here is in an HTML table. And what it will do is it will extract that information. It says, oh, this is a table. Do you want me to put things in these columns? And then you can save it as a CSV. Yes, that's exactly what I want you to do. Because what I can do is I can use another cool tool to visualize this information. Let's take a look at that. So here we have all of this good information, but man, just seeing patterns in here, kind of hard. So let's go to a tool that's free, that's Multigo's case file. What I'm going to show you now is how to import information into case file, and we're going to visualize that data. So I'm going to import as a third party table. And this is going to allow me to import that CSV. I'm going to do it fully meshed. I want everything connected to everything else. And then it asks me what content or what objects each of these are. For Multigo, since it's going to represent everything as objects, it, we need to tell it what the types of data are here. So here, this registrar is actually a company. So I'm going to click on that column and change this to company up here change it to company now I don't have anything that show that is a date so I'm just going to leave column two as it is here the Multigo application has already figured out that this is actually a domain name and then the last thing I need to do before the magic happens is go to the connectivity graph I need to tell it how things are connected together so what we're going to do is we're going to delete some of these connections I'm going to say that a domain is registered on a certain date and a domain is also related to a certain registrar. Let's see if that works. Hit next and then import. Next it says it created it and let's see how this looks. Now, the good thing about Multigo's case file is that it does the visualization for us. See all these little um, nodes, all these little dots? We can zoom in. I'm going to click on this little visualization here, which groups them a little bit differently than normal. Now, what we're seeing here are things like this. When I mouse over that, we see that this registrar, the CSC corporate domain, as I zoom in here, you see CSC corporate domains, are connected to all of these different domains, okay? So we have the, the data is now aggregated and kind of merged together. So multiple objects that are the same or similar are now connected to each other. Likewise, we can see that on this date, 2014, March 30th, this domain over here, oops, sorry, this domain over here, 2014beats.com, and uh, this domain were both registered. Does that matter? Well, it might. If you register a whole bunch of domains at the same time, well, that could I, show that maybe somebody is going to be putting up a whole bunch of phishing websites at the same time, or maybe there's some kind of connection there. One of the things I love doing with this data is looking for the outliers. We can see here, and I'll bet you can kind of understand that this CSC corporate domains is probably the company that Apple.com has a, uh, a contract with for their domains. You see all of these domains are connected to that one registrar. And we have a couple of other here. Sometimes there's different spellings of it, like um, this is Mark Monitor, okay? Here is CSC corporate domains without the incorporated. Yeah, I'm looking over here in the right-hand section. Um, sometimes we, we see that kind of stuff. So these are the same company, these two, but we have Mark Monitor over here. And then let's look down here. See these, these little domains? 
here's one enom now that's a different domain registrar it's not the one that i'm assuming apple has a contract with and look at the domain name andy sharman.com we also have another one over here let's see here we have a couple of them that are for the pdr limited domain we have some over here well that's just domain name here there's one angelishick.com is for registered at register.com so what this is is people that have probably used their apple.com email their work email to register personal domains and the way that it popped out at us was that there were no other official apple domains that were registered to these domain registrars so these are the outliers and we can figure out more information about it and analyze deeper cool so that's case file that's a visualization of data wow we're cruising through this Let's go ahead and wrap it up with a fun thing that um, I like to do here with breach data. Now, some of you know about breach data. Breach data is when somebody breaks into a website and steal, when a bad person steals data from inside of a website, like usernames, passwords, credit card information, and then they release all or part of that to the internet. And then other people get that information and they do bad things like they try to log into your accounts or steal data or use your credit card numbers. Well, the Have I Been Pwned website is actually a helpful one and one that's not so helpful to us as OSINT people. See, you can type whatever email you want, address you want in here, like, well, let's go with Obama at whitehouse.gov. Now, the Obama at whitehouse.gov email address I just typed in here does show up in 31 breaches and 33 pastes. That might be found on the website pastebin.com. This is indicative of, of an account that's been around for a while and is used on multiple sites. As a penetration tester, as somebody that's looking to target whoever owns the Obama at whitehouse.gov email, I now have 31 um, dumps to go and find what password was used with this account. Because remember, when somebody posts that breach data out to the internet, they will post the email address many times with the password that was used. And then if I wanted to, I could go ahead and, and look at what this account actually uh, was doing on those websites, etc. But have I been pwned does not show you the email address. In fact, it won't even show you the, the specific information where it got the data from. Uh, we do have uh, some information here, like it was found on the Bitcoin forum, uh, data enrichment, Discus, Dropbox, but we don't have the specific information that was found about Obama at whitehouse.gov. Well, there are other sites out there that will allow us to have access to it. Now the question here is a big ethical one. Are you allowed to use breach data in your assessments? Some of you are saying, yeah, of course, because the attackers can use breach data. Well, before you use breach data, you do need to make sure with your legal team that it's okay because depending upon where you are, it may be against the law to use certain types of data or to use that data in certain ways. What I wanna show you is, is Oh, kind of behind the scenes, behind the curtain look at how we can look up this data on a website that I have access to. This is dhash.com. You can see I'm logged in there with my uh, account. We can search for anything we want. I'm going to search for Obama at whitehouse.gov. Of course, it gives me that. Well, I've actually got that up. Ha ha. See? Preparedness. So this is what Obama at whitehouse.gov and the word Dropbox together pull back. And here we see the Obama at whitehouse.gov was found in the share this dump. Oh, of course. Hang on. Let's see. Let's see. Usually this is Cloudflare saying, I got to check and make sure you're a real person. All right. Now we should be good. 
and back to the story. All right, Cloudflare protecting us. All right, so here we have share this dump. When I click on here, I see um, that in this dump, we have this email and this name, username, this email address, and that username. Now, this probably, to me, it looks like a hash of a password. And in fact, if we go down to the Dropbox dump, we see that instead of a clear text password, Dropbox was uh, using a hash to protect its passwords, which is great because that hash right here is one that Google and other sites don't know what it actually results in. So somebody has made a very strong password that that can has not been cracked or been broken or been um, had the clear text of what that password is. Um, it, it we don't know what this hash translates to. So what we can do with this is if we take this and we go back to our site, what if, what would happen if I took this hash of a password that hasn't been broken, that we don't know what the clear text is, and put it back in and said, instead of looking for a specific email address, let's, let's look for a password. Could we find other accounts where this user used the same password? Well, let's see. Doing that, we see in the Dropbox dump, there's also this account and that account. Now, some of these look like somebody just pounded on the keyboard, right? I mean, these don't necessarily look like real accounts here. And each one of these has, wait a second, Bruce Willis at Hollywood.com, last name at mail.com. They all have the same hashed password, Hannibal at cannibal.com. All of these have the same password. Bill Gates at Microsoft, come on. Now, what do you think? Do you think Bill Gates at Microsoft and, and Barack Obama have Dropbox accounts and they all manage to somehow synchronize their password? No, of course not. What probably happened is somebody created an account on Dropbox. They went in and they, they set a really secure password, you know, horse correct battery staple or something like that. And then they filled up their space on Dropbox and they needed another account. And like, crud, well, I, I can come up with another name like Bill Gates or Frodo at cozifoldy.hu. I could come up with another email, but I really want to keep that password because it's really complicated and I can remember it. So what we can do is we can tie patent accounts together across different sites using passwords. Now let me do one more thing here. I know we're at an hour here. Let me just show you one more thing because as somebody that is um, a English speaker and not a speaker of other languages, I would just wanna show you that the data in these databases, it ranges all of the different languages. For instance, if I type in a super secret password here, one that is used in millions of sites around the world, password, password, and then I translate it to Russian, we get parole, parole. I'm gonna copy that, and let's put that in dehashed. Let's look and see what happens when these Cyrillic characters are searched upon. What type of top-level domain would you expect? Yep, dot .ru. And when we click on these, we, oh, this person had a super, super strong password. Parole, 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 parole. Four passwords. Yeah, see, even sometimes when they say, you know, make a long password. If you make a long password out of very bad passwords, it doesn't help. So we can search for other character sets in these database dumps and find really, really informa interesting information. Well, I think we've come to the end of the hour. Let's wrap it up. And for this, I'm gonna go ahead and go back on camera. Hi, everybody. So, as I mentioned when I first started out, I told you about the Ocean Curious website. And I did that because I know that many of you are sitting at home and I know that many of you are, are using your training budget right now or, or whatever to, to, to learn new things. 
check out osyncurious.com. It's all free and there's great content there. And if you're interested in even more information about open source intelligence, the SEC 487 course now in Cybercast and on demand is something you might be interested in. Um, what is Cybercast? Well, Cybercast is a, it's a virtual training. It is where somebody like me does something like this for somebody like you. And we do it across the entire week of class. Uh, my class is a six day class. So you meet, we meet uh, Monday through Friday or whatever dates are specified in this page here on the right hand side. Um, we meet and then I teach you live or if you take a cybercast of another class, they will, and the instructor that's teaching that class will teach you live in whatever time zone you are in. So if you're in Singapore, they're doing the nine to five classes or eight to five classes, whatever it's scheduled in the Singapore time zone. Uh, you get books, you get challenges, you get these bonus sessions as well. And um, just before I go here, I did want to, before I open it up to questions, I did want to give you this slide, which has all of the links that I think you need for the SEC 487 class, for the certification that we're going to be getting in June for that class and for the SANS at Mike URL. Now I'll put on my spectacles and we'll take a look at questions. Uh, for those of you that don't want to stick around for questions, thank you so much for coming and spending an hour with me. I really do appreciate it. And uh, stay us and curious, everybody. Now, for those of you that have asked questions, let's go ahead and take a look at what you have said. Let's see. Da -da -da -da. We've got any opinions on memes and screenshots regarding mis or disinformation? Mitch, I see that you did leave, so I'm going to skip that. Former, let's see. Um, does the SANS.org website still auto ban the IP address of anyone who visits the robot.txt file? That is a very interesting question, Brian. Um, one of the things that Brian mentions is that uh, a ta or since we know as system administrators that there are bad people that possibly could be looking at our robots.txt files, one of the things that we can do is put some honey tokens in there, uh, directories, files that don't actually exist and that never existed. And if somebody actually visits that web page, the only way that they could have known about it is if they had visited the robots.txt and are enumerating the different shares. And so one of the things we can do is take active defense. If you're doing something that I as the system administrator or web administrator don't want you to do, then I'm gonna block or ban your IP address. I don't know, to answer your question, if SANS does that, Brian, I think that might've been a while ago when they were a smaller, when the, the website was a smaller shop. You can try it out. Try it on a VPN. That way, if you get banned, you still can access your portal account. All right. So let's see what else we got here. I think. Da -da -da -da. What do you think about sitemap in robots.txt file? Well, sitemap is very similar. We can also use that. But sitemap will tell you what's actually in the site. And that's really helpful too, especially if you're looking for certain pages uh, like about us or payroll or, or organization charts or whatever. So the sitemap is a uh, .xml file is also at the root level of many domains and it can be helpful for us as well. Um, is auto is a robots.txt file generated or available for many websites? Yeah, actually um, you can go to any website you want, you know, uh, bbc.co.uk slash robots.txt. The file may be there or it might not be there. Um, and if it is there, you get a little bit more insight into um, your site. All right, uh, let's see. How did you map the untapped map coordinates? Marco, one of the things I did was I took, whenever somebody goes to untapped and says, I drank here, that location or that the location is actually stamped with the record. And then I take that and I say, hey, Google, do you know what this is? And I do that via Python to Google's API, or they have a, a server out there that's listening for addresses. I give them my API key, which is not necessarily free, but it's kind of free. Um, 
it, and I say, here's my key. I'm authorized to get this information, and I need to know what the GPS latitude and longitude are for this address. And then it replies with either I don't know or here's a latitude and longitude. That's what I put in the app. Dhash premium, that's right. Yeah, thank you, Timothy. Uh, Dhash premium functions are free until the 21st of March. Not that I'm promoting dhash.com at all um, there uh, or your use of breach data, but the site is free uh, for a little while. Am I coming to Virginia Beach in 2020, Jeffrey? We are not doing any live training for SANS, um, and I'm not traveling anywhere until at least June, all right? And do you have any, do you have or use any reverse image searching in my work? I do, Dow. Um, reverse image searching, I will point you to the OSINT Curious website. I think we have a blog post about that, um, and you can do that. You can look at it there. All right, cool. How can one find info hidden in videos or images? Brad, if you're talking about things like steganography, there are steg detector tools that, that are out there. Uh, if you're talking more about metadata, check out OSINT Curious. I believe there's a 10 minute tip on using the EXIF tool to extract metadata from files. All right, everybody. Well, that's all the time I've got. Again, thank you so much for sharing uh, your Monday night with me or Monday morning with me. Stay as curious, everybody. Bye.